well, hello, I'm doing this in a kind of a noisy environment, but I like sitting outside in the summertime. So that's what I'm doing. Today, I'm going to cover what it's like to write as a scholar, as well as what are what is the structure of a research type manuscript. And then I'll cover other things in class. But let's start by learning to write like a scholar. To be a good researcher, you have to consume the research literature. So that, that gives you a good idea of what's going on, right? So, so you need to be reading it. There's two cate broad categories of research literature. One is literature reviews. Actually, let me, I don't know if my camera's on. Oh, it's off. Let me just put my camera on. Okay, so one is, is literature reviews and the other is empirical research. Literature reviews basically provide you a review of what's going on in the field. Motorcycles are always the loudest things, but people like my road because we're right by the river and people drive on the river for the scenic beauty. So literature reviews provide you a basic background about some topic covering what has been done in the field to the best of their ability. There are two types are structured literature reviews and meta-analysis is technically not a literature review, but it is like one. So both of these types of literature reviews, they try to isolate the best studies possible to find the best possible results. The meta-analysis actually comes up with an effect size. So they're actually using data to do this, data that researchers provide. Like I've been asked to provide data for meta-analyses before. So we provide means and standard deviation. So one can calculate effect sizes as motorcycles. Oh, they're awesome. <laughs> Empirical research is better when one is writing a manuscript. So maybe I didn't say uh, why the li literature review is better when you're just trying to learn something because it actually gives you an idea of what's going on in the field and you can use that to start planning a study. So I usually start by reading a literature review if I don't know anything about a field. I just get, a, get an idea of what's going on. With the empirical research study that's the kind that involves data and if it, if it's if it's qualitative it doesn't have to involve the same kind of numbers that you would have in a quantitative study qualitative study though involves data it involves interviews case case histories and other things like that so it still does provide some data and empirical research studies they address research questions and or, and hypotheses the goal then is to answer something and you could do that similarly in a literature review you can answer some kind of a question but you're just not using data for that a good idea before starting to write particularly if you're going to be doing a lot of writing is to get yourself a citation some citation software I use EndNote. EndNote is not free. It's not cheap. But if there's a bunch of students putting their money together, you can probably buy EndNote. It's the best. It's the, the standard for, for citing software. I know there are other software platforms available that are free. I just don't use them because I use EndNote. I'd rather use EndNote. EndNote links me with whatever journals and, and uh, these mag mega databases it also allows me to change my my reference style like for instance i may be using apa style but then i need to use numbered citations and i have to just hit a button and it'll do it for me so that's really good but you should have one if you're writing a lot because really doing this by hand is a pain in the rear start writing write every day now this depends on what your goals are but every one of you is an in, 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 in an academic realm where you have to write all the time. So you might as well just write like you exercise. Say you're going to do push-ups every day. Well, why not write? You're exercising a different kind of muscle. Give yourself about an hour per day, if you can. If not, maybe a half an hour. And just write. Write inter uninterrupted. What one of my professors called throwing up on the paper. 
the way she did it, explained it was like, you just get there and just blah, vomit on the paper, just write whatever's coming out. Let your stream of consciousness play with the paper, right? What I do, and I, those of you who've had me before as a professor, you know, I always advocate reading all the literature, putting down the papers so you don't have any access to them, get them out of your sight, and then start writing. The reason you do that is because by doing so, you'll bring about your understanding of what you read, blending everything together, blending it together with your personal experience in life. So you come up with your own create creative interpretation of what you read. That has so many benefits. Like I said, it, it, it creates creativity, but it also reduces the likelihood that you'll plagiarize because now you're doing things blending your own personal experiences it's like having your fingerprints on the paper so it's, it's an awesome way to write now just because you do something uncritically right uncritically at first doesn't mean you don't have to go back and fix everything so that's what you do in the second step is you go back and start fixing everything that you wrote to make sure it's correct grammatically eliminate spelling errors Make sure that everything makes sense as you're reading it. This is important, especially for comprehend, like uh, writing for comprehension, because I, I mentioned that a lot of people in sciences don't know how to communicate well with others, so the reader doesn't comprehend what they're writing. So you want to make sure that you're writing so that they can understand, depending on what you're doing. But if you're certainly, if you're either submitting something for publication for review for publication or you're submitting something for a grant messy manuscripts aren't going to cut it people see you as being messy if you can't write in a clear and clean fashion so especially if you're looking for money they'll say why should i give money to this person if they can't even you know metaphorically make their bed every day right so you want to make sure that's nice and clean okay and then once you're done with all this, now you can cite your sources. See, I do that last. I don't do that right away. I do that last. I go back and then say, where did that idea come from? And then I'll start citing my sources. I do this regularly. Every time I start writing, I go back. Like I just finished my stats, second edition of my stats textbook. And there's areas where I cited stuff. So what I kept on doing was I kept going back afterwards and saying, oh, where did I get that from? Where did I get this from? And I start citing my sources. Just as everything in life, there's a lot of cri criticism involved. We see this all the time. I mean, our, our country seems to love, or the, our globe, our world seems to love criticizing others, not looking at ourselves, but looking at the work of others. So you, to be a really successful academic writer, you have to be able to deal with criticism. Criticism or negative feedback cause what's known as disequilibrium. So disequilibrium is a very uncomfortable feeling when what you believe doesn't match the data of experience. So here's an example. I believe I'm an excellent writer, but then receive feedback contradicting my self-conception. This happens a lot, particularly when people enter college from high school. When that happens, they they're, you know, they may be told told that they're the best writer possible in high school, and then they get to college and their professor's marking everything with red pen or something and they feel really bad because they said, wait a minute, there's something wrong. And they might argue that the professor is incompetent or something or doesn't understand their writing, but eventually they're going to feel pretty bad about this. So I want you to think about this as you're doing whatever you're doing. Think about one experience when a conception you had about either the self or any kind of concept received strong negative feedback. In other words, you are wrong. What was the experience like in terms of your feelings and your behaviors? So equilibrium is the opposite of disequilibrium. So this is when your data, when, when your conceptions match the data of experience. So I'll, I'll, I'll use an example. I'll use this a couple of times. I, I, last year I published a paper I was met with very positive reviews all around and I thought that was going to happen and it actually happened. That was one of the few times, believe me, that it, that ever happened. But I had experience working with that journal. I had experience writing on the topic. I saw what happened the first time I did it. 
so I was well prepared. So now, now I was that I already had adapted. So that 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 was perfect. So think about a recent experience in your life when a conception of yours was correct. What was the experience like in terms of your feelings and your behaviors or your behavior? Adaptation. So you may or may not know, I've already, I just wrote this book where I talk about the role of self and adaptation and learning and development. So that would, that's something that I, I focus on a lot. Adaptation is basically changing one's conceptions and behavior to match the constraints of the environment. The constraints are the rules, basically. All environments have rules, including the writing environment. When one adapts, one turns equal disequilibrium into equilibrium. As that, that, there's a lot to that model more than that, but that's a simple way of looking at it. So here's an example of mine after. So this is actually the first manuscript that I submitted and got published before I wrote the other one that that received positive feedback. So after receiving the net, negative feedback about the manuscript, and boy, this feedback was negative, and this person didn't hold back, the editor, I carefully changed the way I wrote to match the reviewers and the editor's requirements, and the manuscript was accepted. So I adapted to the constraints. I learned what they were. Oh, so while I'm writing, I just saw one of those uh, school buses pass by, old school buses where I live. This is tubing country. People go tubing and that, when the summer starts, the school buses are as ubiquitous as beer is in the world you know, so, or alcohol is globally. So here, here's what happened to me. I thought I knew what was best and was rebuked strongly by the editor for my poor response. I, so I, what I had to do was I basically rebelled against myself and I ended up learning the constraints or the rules I had to adapt to. And then I changed my conception of what a good manuscript was for that journal. So my adaptation was to that journal, right? I changed it and then I was able to get accepted. So essentially what I did was I changed my belief about what what is a good manuscript for that journal. I adapted, I re-experienced equilibrium and I got accepted. So that's what adaptation is all about. It's the ability to, the ability to, to turn the negative into the positive by understanding what the environment is asking for. So this whole idea of adaptation, it's a growth process. I actually call it psychoadaptation. That's the term that I I coined by blending psychological, psychological with adaptation. So there's a psychological adaptation. So it's a growth process. Every time we attain this new equilibrium, we're better than we were in a qualitative sense. So we're superior to our prior self before the adaptation occurs. It's interesting when we attain equilibrium, we feel really great. And, and for that moment, for that very brief moment, there's nothing else existing in the world. And that's when we tend to experience like the flow state or some people call it the oceanic feeling. Some people call it nirvana. So whatever that you want to call it, that occurs when there is nothing left to do. So there's no separation between us and, and other, us and the environment. That's what happens when we start achieving these goals and when we adapt. So it's a really cool process. All right, let's talk about the research manuscript. Actually, a lot of people are experiencing equilibrium today as they're going out and you know, just partying or whatever they're doing. It feels great. The research manuscript manuscripts are what researchers write and submit to journals for review. So there's a manuscript. If the manuscript is accepted for publication, but it's not yet published, it's considered in press. Once it's published, it's an article. So you got the manuscript, either it's rejected or accepted. And we'll talk more about that later. But anyway, in that in that process, if it's been accepted, it's called in press. Uh, that's my one of my favorite things to write. So when you're when you're citing something, instead of writing the author's name and then date an APA style or whatever style you're using, you just write in press. Research articles have seven sections, and that's what I'll go over now. 
you have the title page, the title, and it, you, they vary in length. Okay, I, I, I had somebody who was submitting a manuscript for review and they gave you 40 pages for an original article. That includes everything, of course, but 40 pages, that's a lot of pages. That's not always the norm. I like the way motorcyclists always go in, in gang. They have many gangs. They, they go together. And another thing I like is when they say hi to each other when they pass by. So I have this like this hyper blue Subaru a cross track. There weren't a lot of them made, but every time I, I see one and I'm driving my Subaru cross track, hyper blue, we always wave at each other. So we have our own bicycle thing. Yeah. All right. So the title page has the title, the authors institutions funding information if the if the study was funded by a grant and the keywords so you have to usually have to present some keywords that's followed by an abstract an abstract is a a paper in miniature generally it's no more than like 250 words it can be structured or unstructured. Structured means it has headings. So you could have subheadings, right? Within the so like a little headings that you'd have in a paper. Usually they're bold or it could be unstructured with no headings. It's used for marketing, like to help people decide whether or not they want to read the article. So you, you generally do it in a way that presents the highlights of your, of your article if it's published. So let's move on to the introduction. So I give you, in this, I introduce eight rules for successful manuscript that transcends the introduction and covers all parts. So you'll see me passing through the introduction as well as method section and everything else. But it says rule number one, always start a research manuscript by presenting the epidemiologic data. So even if you're thinking, wait, I'm in psychology, I'm not studying epidemiology. Well, in psychology, you deal with diseases, with the depression, anxiety, PTSD, whatever they are, those are diseases. And those there's data on the prevalence, which is the, the current amount that's in, in existence in the population. Usually you get that from the CDC. Usually you get that from the CDC. That's a particularly loud one, yeah. The CDC, so that's the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So you get the pre prevalence information there. So we have, we have good data sources. You know, sometimes I think when that, when a motorcycle and cars are passing, it sounds like the ocean in the background. So maybe I, I'm sitting in front of the ocean. That's what it is. Yeah, I'm sitting on my my porch because I, I get this really nice. There weren't a lot of trees there. I have a really nice view of the river, but there's a lot of trees. Rule number two: review what is already done focusing on your independent and dependent variables. Those are the independent variables are your predictors, the dependent variables are your outcomes and the type of research you propose to do. You have to be careful here though. You don't wanna write a manuscript suggesting a novel idea only to be discovered or to discover to discover the research has already been done. And that's kind of a sucky situation because you did all this work and somebody says, hey, we already did that. That happens a lot. So that's why you review the literature. You're trying to find, I mean, you hope not to find something like you did because then it's like, oh, darn, I did all this work for nothing. I'm actually working on preparing a manuscript now with a student that I'm working, who I'm working with. And we have a really good idea. We got to look through the literature. And if it, listen, if it's been done, and there hasn't been a lot of stuff done on it that you're welcome to do it again, but you have to portray, you have to portray it correctly. This is a replication study. So, so that's not, it's not all lost if it's been done already. Look for flaws in the existing literature and you want to be able to exploit those flaws because sometimes things have been done, but then there are flaws in the way they were done, perhaps in the methods, the psychology, they didn't cover some pertinent theories or something like that. But when you do, look for flaws and you write that in your in your manuscript be careful not to insult the authors of those studies because they may be the people reviewing your work and the introduction with your research question and hypothesis or hypotheses 
Like what's the aim of your study? What is or are the hypotheses you're investigating? So this is a pretty interesting. This is There's a formula for writing a paper. Start with the epidemiologic data. Otherwise, why would anybody be interested if it's not something that's highly prevalent? If it's a very rare disease, then you have to have a reason why you're presenting a very rare disease. You do the literature review and you present that. And this may include theoretical models or whatever, but you're presenting the current state of the science, trying to find holes to build a case for your for your hypotheses and your research aim. So you're going to build it in this fashion. So you culminate it with your research aim. So people should be reading your your work and saying, yeah, 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 this is awesome. So I can't wait to see what she's going to do next. And yes, this is it. Yes, that's what you want, right? Reminds me of a scene from Elf and when the one author goes, Miles Finch goes, yes. Next you, comes your methods. So on your methods, for, they start with participants and procedures. So this is a detailed explanation of what you are doing to whom. So how did you recruit your participants? What are your inclusion and exclusion criteria? What kind of incentives do you have? Also, you know, how many people you have, obviously, too. In some cases, you want to detail. But if you're doing an experiment, you have to detail how you got to your sample size. Like we started by recruiting 2,000 people. We got responses from 1,000 of them. And of those 1,000, we screened them. We could only keep 500. And then of those 500... 250 showed up in day one. That's my sample size. So you build this this nice little chart that that shows how your you arrived at your sample size. You also want to talk about whether or not you used incentives. So here under Rule Five, it's a little bit of a, a move away from what the 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 kind of the zeitgeist I call it spirit of the times in my writing here. You talk about incentives make sure that your incentives aren't too large to be coercive but large enough to recruit participants right so you want to make sure your incentives are just right like for instance in a study i'm doing with smoking now the incentives are good but they're not overly good otherwise they'd be considered coercive people do anything for money and you'd be surprised Instrumentation, what measures were used, provides statistical data that demonstrates the validity and the reliability of, me of the measure. I was reviewing somebody's work recently as part of a committee, and the individual provided reliability information, but didn't say anything about the validity. And so I said, hey, you know, you really need to talk about the validity. Validity means, and we'll talk more about this later, a measure measures what it was designed to measure. So if I'm claiming that my measure looks at... um say, I don't know, bicycling competence, it better measure bicycling competence than not skateboarding competence. Usually people pro provide factor analysis results from prior studies, Cronbach coefficient alphas. The alpha seems to be the most common measure that's provided. Although I don't know why, that only measures reliability and it's just one of many different types of measures of reliability. Uh, let's see. Ideally, you'd want to repeat these with your present study too. So, like for instance, with your present study and your data, you want to do a Cronbach's coefficient alpha, and you should do a factor analysis. A factor analysis is applicable to the original study data, not yours. So, you want to make sure that it's holding up before you move on. Now, if, there, if there's a lot of evidence, like certain scales that I use, something like the Rosenberg self-esteem scale has been done over and over again. You really don't need to do uh, another replication because it's been done that hundreds and maybe even thousands of times. What's your data analysis plan? Like what statistics will be used? If you're doing something really common, like a regression analysis, you don't have to provide us details. Just say, well, I'm doing the linear regression analysis controlling for these variables. If you're doing something more complicated, like a structural equation modeling, you should explain what it means because most people don't know what that is. You think you probably think, well, that's it. <laughs> you when you talk more about stats now, but that's really the rea reality of it. Results, you always start by providing descriptive statistics. Those are the means and standard deviations for continuous variables and frequencies and proportions for discrete variables. Here's a prototypical descriptive statistics table. You might as well keep this because if you have to make one, this is what it should look like. So here, 
we have the variable like sex, male, female, the number and the percentage of the data. And it's something like depressive symptoms, which is continuous. We give a mean and a standard deviation. Then you present your primary results, including simple tables and figures, whatever is applicable to your method. Rule number six, do not repeat what is in your table in the text. Just report significant results. Results section, you shouldn't see a replication of everything. I mean, why would you present a table if you're going to repeat it all in the text? So the text should only focus in the results section on what's significant. Rule number seven goes to the discussion. So the discussion is where you talk about what was interesting about the paper. So that's rule number seven. Never repeat what you wrote in the results section. Some people like to regurgitate the results section in the discussion. That's not what a discussion is for. The discussion is there to provide what's interesting about this and what's been missing, what gaps there are, et cetera, what limitations there are with the study. Rule number eight, do not make claims that stretch your results too far. So do not take, I love this term, a conceptual leap of faith. That's the same, comes from the same professor that Dr. Patricia Alexander, who came up with a throwing up on your paper. She was like, really good at coining these these uh, these nice little terms or, or whatever you want to call them. So the discussion should like basically be something that makes me think. Maybe future directions, how does it apply to the field? Depends on the journal you're submitting to. Some journals will say, hey, give us implications for counseling and psychotherapy, give us implications for public health, whatever. That's where you do that. And then of course you have your references cited. Additional sections you may find are tables and figures. So if you have tables and figures, when you're submitting the manuscript, those would go in a separate section. Tables and figures are by themselves. And then some journals will ask you to, to write within the, the, the text where you want to place the, the, the tables and figures, others don't. There may be supplementary information like data files or coding for programs. I actually, in my last publication I did, since it was a, since I made the data up using Monte Carlo method, so basically I generated my own data. I provided the syntax for how to do that, so one could do it on their own, where I got it from, so one could technically just do exactly what I did. So that's transparency, and that's a good thing. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, and enjoy your, your holiday weekend, and if you're a motorcyclist, go cycle, but make it quieter, please. You know, I don't like that noise. All right, have a great day. Bye.